to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Kendall. Friends, happy Easter. My name is Charlie Dunn, and I have the privilege, along with John, of getting to pastor this new neighborhood church in and for Lake Highlands. We are so glad and grateful that you would choose to come and worship with us as we celebrate which, that which is literally the greatest news in the history of the world. And I know that may sound a little bit like preacher's hyperbole, but I am not kidding with you, friends. If Jesus really is risen from the dead, let me tell you what that means. It means that we do not, as Christians, follow a dead religious teacher from whom we can glean a little bit of inspiration for our lives. No, rather, we follow a living Savior, a God who is alive that we can know, that we can have a relationship with right now today. If Jesus is risen from the dead, it means that everything that you have ever done wrong in your life can be forgiven. You can be free from guilt. You can be free from shame because the resurrection of Jesus is God's way of stamping paid in full on all of the sins that Jesus died for for us on the cross. If Jesus is risen from the dead, it means you can be free even from the fear of death. You don't have to live your life afraid that when you die, you're going to cease to exist. Because if Jesus is risen from the dead, the Bible says he's the first fruits from among the dead, meaning that God will so too raise up all of those who die trusting in Jesus. If Jesus is risen, that means the grave does not get the last word in your life. If Jesus is risen from the dead, it means that your life matters. It means the things that you do tomorrow and the next day, the way that you work for the good of your neighbors, the way you try to make the world a little bit of a better place, a little bit more just, it means the world's not going to one day burn up in the end. But just as God raised Jesus from the dead, that same healing, renewing power is going to restore the entire world. If Jesus is risen from the dead, it means no matter how hard your life might be today, and I look out in this sanctuary and I know that some of you are going through some really hard and painful things. But if Jesus is risen from the dead, in the end, you will not miss out. You're going to get this life back, but so much better. And if Jesus is risen, even the hardest things in our lives, God is able to turn those for our good. Our good things can truly never be taken away from us. And the very best things are still to come if Jesus is risen from the dead. Of course, all of that assumes that Jesus really is risen from the dead. And I imagine there might be some of you this morning who aren't quite sure that that's true. Maybe a friend, maybe a family member invited you to worship here today and, and you're not quite convinced. You wonder, did that really happen? Jesus, after he was brutally executed and buried in a tomb, did he really bodily rise again from the dead, never to die again? And maybe you're shocked to look around this room and to think to yourself, do these people really believe that? I mean, don't they know that dead people don't come back to life? And can I tell you, if that's your perspective here this morning, can I say you sound like a very reasonable person? <laughs> I'm very glad that you are here with us this morning. Frankly, you should be skeptical about the kind of claim that a dead person would come back to life. You know, the people in Jesus' day, they were skeptical. They didn't believe that dead people come back to life. But you know, what happened is that they were so overwhelmed by the evidence, the evidence that Jesus was risen from the dead, it was so formidable that it actually overcame their doubts. It overcame their objections. And it can overcome your doubts and your objections, even as it has overcome mine. I mentioned in a sermon a couple of weeks ago, if I were not a Christian, I think I would be a cynic. 
And there's something attractive, something appealing about that cynicism to me. I find myself sometimes in those seasons of doubt, even as a pastor, where my calling is to share the good news of Jesus with others. There are those times when I wonder to myself, do I really believe it's true? Do I really believe that Jesus is actually the creator of the universe having come in flesh? Do I really believe he died for all of our sins? Do I really believe that centering my life around Jesus is worth it? That that's where abundant life truly is found, as Jesus claims. And in those moments of doubt and cynicism, I go back to the resurrection. I go back to the evidence for the resurrection. And I find that it holds. That really there was this publicly acknowledged recognition that the tomb was empty. There really were hundreds of people at various times and places who saw Jesus bodily risen from the dead. There really were thousands of Jewish people who from their earliest days, they grew up believing that it would be the height of blasphemy to worship a human being as God. And yet within days of Jesus' alleged resurrection, they were worshiping Jesus as God. What led to that? There really were disciples who were cowering in fear after Jesus' death, who suddenly were so emboldened that they went out proclaiming the good news that Jesus was risen, leading to their brutal deaths, and they did not die for what they knew to be a lie. And the church really did emerge and grow and spread in spite of all of the persecution and opposition that the early Christians faced And you see, all this evidence is what led somebody like the Cambridge scholar C.F.D. Moore, when he looked at the evidence for the, the historical resurrection of Jesus, he said, if the emergence of the Christian movement rips a hole in history, the size and the shape of a resurrection, well, then what does the secular historian propose to stop it up with? All the other alternatives, they fall flat. And I realize, look, I get it. It takes faith to believe that Jesus really rose from the dead, just as it takes faith to believe anything in history. But can I tell you this morning, it is not a blind faith. It is a reasonable faith. It is a historic faith. And if you've never really stopped and taken the time to consider the evidence that Jesus really rose from the dead, can I encourage you to do so? In fact, I would love to come alongside you and help you to do so, as I know many others would in this church community. Because the only way that the resurrection can change your life, and it can, is if you really believe that it happened. As a matter of history, Jesus really did rise from the dead. And I know there are many of you in this room today, and you believe that. You do believe that Jesus really did rise from the dead. And my hope for you then this morning is that you wouldn't just be celebrating something that you intellectually affirm, like something that happened 2,000 years ago. My hope for you is that you more and more would experience the power of Jesus' resurrection unleashed in your life. Because the resurrection can change your life in all of the ways that I already mentioned. But there's one more way that the resurrection can change your life here and now today that I want to focus on together this morning. Paul mentioned it in this passage in Romans 6, which Kendall read for us a moment ago. Paul says if Jesus is really risen from the dead, meaning what? Meaning if the, the, the future healing and renewing power with which God is going to renew the world, if that's been pulled into the present in Jesus' resurrection, if it can be pulled into our lives today, what that means, friends, is you can be freed from your most besetting sins. You can be freed from those vices, from those flaws. Maybe that you begin to see in your life more over time. Maybe that your spouse sees in you. Maybe that your coworkers see in you. And maybe you start to wonder, can I ever really change? If Jesus is risen from the dead, friends, the answer is yes. There is a power to change, a power to be freed from sin in your life. If you've been with us for the last eight weeks, we just went through this series on what are known as the seven deadly sins. 
We talked about why these sins like greed and lust and vainglory and envy and wrath, we said part of why they're so attractive and appealing and they have been all throughout history is because they promise us really good things. They promise us comfort and control and pleasure and security and self-worth. Those are good things. But we said when we pursue those things through these seven deadly sins, what happens is they end up destroying us. They end up hollowing us out in the end. It's like that Alan Jackson song, everything I love is killing me. That's true of the seven deadly sins. They alienate us from God and they ultimately begin to sap our own soul. Nothing will steal your joy like envy. Nothing will begin to rot your heart like harboring bitterness and resentment. Nothing will actually make you feel more insecure than a fixation on yourself in vain glory. Nothing will steal your contentment like greed. And yet Paul tells us if Jesus is risen from the dead, you can be free from the power of sin. Those besetting vices, they don't control you anymore. You have the power to change. You can become more that person that you long to be and that person that God longs for you to be as well. And so I want to just ask two questions in our remaining time together. Here they are. First, how does the resurrection of Jesus free us from the power of sin? And then secondly, how can we experience that life-changing power today. So let's ask those two questions together. So first, how does the resurrection free us from the power of sin? You might have noticed in verse five, Paul says that if you are a Christian, you have been united to Jesus. You know, that's the language that the New Testament most often uses to describe what it means to be a Christian, someone who is in Christ, united to Jesus. Christ. I remember when I graduated from college, I moved back to to Dallas. I was living in a house with some roommates. And one day I came home and I saw one of my roommates who's kind of a bigger guy, kind of a man's man. He loved to hunt and fish. He played baseball in college. And so you can imagine my surprise when I see him holding this delicate little plant. And he has this plant in his hands and he's, he's taking part of one plant and he's attaching it to the stem of another plant, putting tape around it. And I looked at him and I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm grafting. And I said, grafting? What on earth is grafting? I said, don't you know that you can't just take part of one plant and then attach it to another plant with tape and expect it to grow up together? And he said, that's exactly what I expect to happen. And he started to explain to me this concept of grafting. I don't think I still understand it. Some of you can tell that. But apparently, apparently you you do. You take part of one plant and you you, you insert it into the stem of another. And and somehow they actually begin to to grow up together. The tissues fuse so that that they become one living plant. And what's true of, of one part becomes true of the other. And you know, that word that Paul uses that is translated from the Greek as united, it actually conveys this idea of grafting. Meaning if you're a Christian, what's true of you is you have been grafted into Jesus Christ. What's true of Jesus is now true of you. And and that works on a couple of different levels. The first level, and this is incredible enough on its own, is that when you trust in Jesus, when you're grafted into Jesus, now the determinative thing in your life from God's perspective is no longer your past, but it's Christ's past. God looks at you now as if you had lived that life of perfect obedience and justice and love that Jesus lived. God looks at you as though you had actually died on a cross for your own sins. There is no condemnation for you now in Christ Jesus. When you trust in Jesus, when you're grafted into him, now God forgives you, he accepts you, he loves you, he delights in you the very same way that he delights in Jesus, his eternal son. And I'll tell you, friends, there is no other religion that even begins to teach anything close to that. Every other religion says that your salvation is something that you have to earn and achieve. 
The Christian gospel is the only good news that says, no, your salvation is received when you trust in Jesus, what's true of him becomes true of you. But there's more to it than that. See, there's a second level at play here that Paul is, is talking about, namely that when you're united to Jesus, his very life begins to flow through you. That his resurrection power actually starts to, to flow through your veins so that now, just as Jesus died on the cross, so too you who are grafted into Jesus have now died to the power of sin. And in the same way that Jesus was raised to a newness of life, now you have been raised to a new life. Paul says if you are in Christ, you've been freed from the power of sin. He says, if you're in Christ, you're no longer a slave to sin. He says, if you're in Christ, your old self was crucified. Uh, some of you might have heard before of, of a, an early Christian named St. Augustine. He wrote a, a spiritual autobiography, really the first autobiography ever written. It was called The Confessions. This was in the 5th century. And Augustine, having become a, a Christian, he looks back on this scene from his teenage years. When he remembers that he and some of his friends, they, they climb the wall of a neighbor's garden to steal some pears. You know, not the worst thing that a teenager could ever do, not the greatest sin anybody could commit, but he looks back on that moment in his life and he asks the question, he says, I wonder, why did I go steal those pears? As he thinks about it, he says, why did I steal them when, when A, I wasn't hungry, and B, I don't even like pears? And you know, his answer is C. He says, because somebody told him no. Somebody told him he couldn't do it. Somebody put a rule and said, no, you can't cross this line. And he said, I wanted to do it. Somebody told me no, so I wanted to say yes. Some of you who have toddlers right now, you're living this real time. This hits a little bit too close to home, maybe for some of you. But Augustine says, you know, this is actually true of every single human heart, that there is that bent that desire, that turning in on ourselves where we want to be in charge. We want to call the shots. We want to make the rules. Really, we want to be our own God. And you know, that's what the Bible calls sin. Wanting to run and rule our lives apart from the good God who created us. And it doesn't mean that you never do anything good for other people, but what it does mean is that there is this innate selfishness in every single one of us being turned in on ourselves, looking at life through the lens of what is in it for me. But you see, Paul says, when you come to know Jesus as your savior, he says something actually changes. Something changes in the deep fundamental structure of your heart. When you see God carrying a cross for you, when you see Jesus suffering and dying on the cross and you realize he was there dying for your sins, when you realize he was doing that out of nothing but love for you, it actually begins to change you. Yeah, sure, you're still selfish in some ways, of course, we're still sinful in ways, but now alongside that old self is a new self, a self that actually wants to begin to live for God, where you say, I want to live for him. I, maybe I can trust that a God who would do that for me is not out to get me. He's not out to steal my fun and my joy. He's not trying to abuse me. Maybe I can trust that he really has my best interests in mind when he calls me to obey because a God who would love me like that, who would give himself for me in that way, you begin to want to give yourself for him, for your neighbors, for your family, for your coworkers. Your heart begins to change. Sometimes people will say, gosh, if you're saved completely by grace, why would you care about obeying? You know, I love sinning. God loves forgiving. We're a match made in heaven. And yet that's the question that Paul is answering here in Romans 6. He says, don't you understand when you are grafted into Jesus and when you see what Jesus has done for you, something changes inside you. The old self dies. A new self is born. If you want to see this in real time, look no further than the life of a guy named Louis Zamperini. 
Any of you heard of him before? You remember that book that became a movie called Unbroken? So here's Louis Zamperini. He goes off to fight in World War II. His plane gets shot down. He ends up spending weeks living out in the Pacific Ocean on a raft. There's sharks circling his raft. There's enemy fire. Eventually, he gets picked up by a Japanese ship and taken off to a Japanese prisoner of war camp, goes through horrendously difficult things, and yet his spirit is unbroken. And eventually, he gets to come back to the United States as a war hero. He marries a beautiful woman named Cynthia. On the outside, his life looks wonderful. But inside, Louis was a very broken man, contrary to the title of the book. He was filled with an anger and resentment toward his Japanese captors. He had an emptiness that he was trying to fill through alcohol. He had this desire for security and significance that he was chasing in a number of get-rich-quick schemes that all ultimately failed. He was deeply broken, but he didn't want to admit it to the point where his wife was ready to divorce him. And then she went to this Christian gathering where she heard the good news of Jesus. And she came home having trusted Jesus as her savior. And she said, I am a new person, Louis. And she said, I want this for you too. And he was really resistant. In fact, he was kind of antagonistic. He was like, after all that I've been through, you think I need God? You think I need religion? You think I need Jesus in my life after all that I have endured in my own strength? But he ended up going. And he heard the gospel message the first day. Second day, he came back and he heard it again. I want you to listen to the way he described the moment when his life was grafted into Jesus Christ, when he trusted Jesus. He said, I dropped to my knees and for the first time in my life, truly humbled myself before the Lord. And I asked him to forgive me for not having kept the promises I'd made during the war. Forgive me for my sinful life. I made no excuses, I did not rationalize, I did not blame. He had said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I took him at his word, begged for his pardon, and asked Jesus to come into my life. And can I tell you, on that day, the old man was crucified. The old self-sufficient Louis was killed on that day, and a newness of life began to flow through his veins. Now there was a joy where before there was only an emptiness. Now he was able to forgive his Japanese captors because he knew the way that God in Christ had forgiven him. He became a devoted and loving husband for the rest of the years of their marriage. He started to serve the underprivileged youth in Los Angeles. Friends, his life was changed, not all in an instant, but progressively, increasingly, he became a new person because now the very resurrection power of Jesus was at work within his life. And I imagine some of you, maybe you hear a story like that and you say, that's wonderful. But maybe you've been following Jesus for a number of years. And you still see some of those same besetting sins in your life. You still trip over some of those same flaws. You say, you might tell me that I'm dead to sin, but I do not feel dead to sin. I still feel very selfish in the way I relate to God and other people. What do you mean I'm dead to sin? And and let me be very clear here. To say that you're dead to sin in Christ, it doesn't mean that you never commit sin. It doesn't mean that you're never selfish anymore. It doesn't mean there's no struggle. Romans 7 is all about that struggle. Nor does it mean that you just start deluding yourself. So next time your spouse says, hey, that was really hurtful or offensive, you say, well, I'm sorry you feel that way, but you must be mistaken because, you know, I'm dead to sin, so I really couldn't have said or done anything that was offensive to you doesn't mean we become delusional. No, rather what it means is this. It means that truly there is now a new power for transformation that you can access and experience in your life. And so how do you do that? Let me end with this. How do you experience that resurrection, life-changing power if you have been grafted into Jesus? Look at verse 11. 
This is the last verse. You know, Paul's written almost six chapters in the book of Romans. He's given zero commands. It's all about, here's what God has done for you in Jesus. This is the first thing that he gives as a command in the book of Romans. What does he say? He says, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, this is who you are. Do you consider yourself in that way? And a lot of people, I think, look at the Christian life and they think that what it means to be a Christian is to try to be something that you're not, to try to be better than you are, to try to be more moral than you are. Friends, nothing could be further from the truth. No, the dynamic of the Christian life, the charge, is be who you already are. Right? Live in light of your new identity. This is the identity. This is who you are in Jesus. Now, do you know how to consider yourself that way? Do you know how to preach to your heart in that way, to tell yourself, this is who I am? You know, it's a great thing if you're a homeless person and you inherit a lot of money. But that money is going to be of no value. It's not going to change your life at all unless you cash it in, unless you access it. How do you access that power that is yours in Jesus? How do you consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus? You know, Augustine, who I mentioned before, when he became a Christian, he was really struggling with lust. That was his master. Really, before being a Christian, he had relationships with all of these different women. That's where he was finding his life. And even when he wanted to be a Christian, he prayed, God, make me chaste, but not yet. Right? That's the, 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 the struggle that had most power over him. But a few years into the Christian life, he started to learn what it meant to consider himself dead to sin but alive to God and Jesus. So one day he's on the streets of Rome, and one of his old girlfriends comes up to him and starts chatting with him, and apparently she kind of wants to, to rekindle the old relationship. And he talks with her. He's very pleasant to her. But then he goes on his way. And after the conversation, she starts to think to herself, well, that's not the Augustine that I know. I thought he would be very interested. And so she starts to wonder, maybe he didn't recognize me. You know, it's been a long time. And so she runs up. She catches up with him. She says, Augustine, it's me. And he turns around and he says, I know it's you, but it's not me. He says, I've changed. He said, I used to be under the mastery of, of lust. I used to have to have a woman in my life to feel like my life mattered, to bring some thrill and significance to my life. And it wasn't love, it was lust because I was using women to try to fill the black hole in my life. But he said, now I have found life in Jesus. I know what it is to be deeply loved in Jesus. There's an excitement, a thrill, a purpose in that relationship I didn't have before. And so now I am dead to lust. But I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus. Maybe for you it's pride or vain glory. Wanting the approval and the attention of other people. And, and often when we don't get that approval, you know, our, our pride begins to swell with a, with a wounded ego. What do you do in those moments? You say, you know, I'm dead to vain glory. I used to have to have the approval and praise of other people to feel like my life mattered. But now I know in Jesus, I have the praise and the approval of the king of the universe. The most important person delights now in me. That is all the glory that any soul could long for. And now I know my life is not about my glory. It's about living for his glory. I'm dead to vain glory, but I'm alive to God in Jesus. Or here's one more. How about anger? Anybody struggle with anger, with irritability? getting frustrated at your coworkers, your, your spouse, your kids in those moments of, of anger, what happens is we feel like we're not in control. And if anything violates our sense of control, we get angry, we get upset. But what do you do in those moments is you say, you know what, I'm dead to anger. I don't have to be in control of my life anymore because now I know that there is a God whom I can trust, a God who gave his very life for me. So I can trust that he is in control of my life. I'm dead to anger, but I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus. Friends, do you know how to preach to your heart in that way? To remind yourself of what is most true of you if you are in Christ? And of course, we can't do that alone. We need a community to do that alongside us. And if you're not part of a Christian community, of a church that can remind you of who you most fundamentally are in Jesus. We would love 
uh, for you to consider being a part of this church, this family being transformed by grace together. Because friends, if Jesus really is risen from the dead, let me tell you, it is not just a great hope for the future, but it is actually a future power that we can access, we can experience right now that can transform and change us today. So let me pray as we come to the Lord's table together. Our Lord Jesus, risen and now seated at the right hand of your Father in heaven, we thank you that perhaps nowhere more than at this communion table are we reminded of our communion with you. The union that we have with you, Jesus, that for those of us who have trusted in you as our Savior, you have united your life with ours so that what is true of you has become true of us. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that as we come to this communion table this Easter Sunday, I pray if there's anybody here in this room today who has never trusted you as their Savior, They've never done like Louis Zamperini and humbled themselves before you, confess their sin and look to you to be their savior. I pray that even today coming forward to this table might be their way of saying, Jesus, I want to trust you. I wanna experience your power in my life. And for those of us, Jesus, who have known you, who have trusted you for many years, I pray that as we come forward to this table, it would be an opportunity for us to say, Jesus, would you help me to experience more of that resurrection power in my life so that I might consider myself dead to sin and alive to God in you. For we ask it in Jesus' name.